experience, experience dan expertise-nya uh, mengenai melakukan riset uh, semasa pandemi COVID-19 ini. Jadi PMB LIPI juga ini sangat kami sebagai lembaga riset bagian dari uh, Lembaga Ilmu Pengetahuan Indonesia uh, sudah mengalami perubahan-perubahan juga yang uh, kami rasakan terutama di masa pandemi dari tahun 2020 kemarin. Jadi uh, pandemi ini telah merubah banyak sekali cara kita bekerja, cara kita melakukan hal-hal termasuk uh, termasuk juga cara kita melakukan penelitian ya. Ada ada banyak hal yang berubah. Jadi pembatasan pergerakan manusia Mungkin yang lebih yang paling terasa itu antar negara. Kalau di Indonesia sendiri mungkin kita masih sedi sedikit lebih merasa bebas dibanding tempat-tempat yang uh, dilakukan lockdown sama sekali ya. Saya juga sempat merasakan uh, sedikit se sebentar uh, hampir setahun dari tahun April itu merasakan lockdown di Melbourne dan itu sangat terbatas sekali kegiatan kita kita tidak bisa ke kampus tidak bisa bertemu teman-teman dan sebagainya jadi masa setahun ini juga kita sedang mencoba kita sebagai lembaga riset atau PMB pusat penelitian masyarakat dan budaya yang merupakan bagian dari LIPI juga mencoba mencari strategi-strategi baru apa yang bisa kita lakukan untuk melakukan riset atau kajian di masa pandemi dengan pembatasan pergerakan maupun ada aturan-aturan uh, ketat lain seperti sosial atau physical distancing uh, dan protokol kesehatan ketat yang harus kita terapkan. Jadi masa-masa yang tidak menentu ini membuat kita kemudian uh, mencari cara-cara baru uh, dan menjadi kreatif sebetulnya. Saya banyak menemukan uh, ada bentuk-bentuk Uh, proses mengumpulkan data maupun uh, proses analisis data ataupun hal-hal lain yang terkait riset yang relatif baru sebetulnya dalam uh, dalam dunia penelitian misalnya saja saya menemukan kawan-kawan uh, yang uh, mengumpulkan data dengan cara melakukan uh, video uh, apa mengkoleksi video atau mengkoleksi uh, suara atau mengkoleksi foto sebagai bagian dari uh, uh, data collection uh, prosesnya. Jadi ini hal-hal yang kreatif dan menarik sebetulnya. Jadi peneliti juga peneliti dan lembaga penelitian kemudian dipaksa untuk membuat strategi-strategi uh, atau mencari langkah-langkah baru yang kreatif, tapi juga tetap melihat dan mener menetap menerapkan uh, etika penelitian yang uh, dan metode penelitian yang baik. Saya rasa. Uh, saya rasa webinar ini datang atau dilakukan pada waktu yang sangat tepat ya PMB sendiri saat ini tengah melakukan penelitian lapangan jadi para peneliti kami juga baru berangkat ke lapangan nih Pak Fidus dan kawan-kawan uh, juga semua jadi ini akan sangat bermanfaat tidak hanya bagi kawan-kawan uh, peneliti di PMB LIPI maupun di LIPI sendiri tapi juga rekan-rekan dosen maupun peneliti-peneliti uh, lepas yang ada di lembaga penelitian manapun, saya rasa ini akan menjadi uh, sebuah diskusi yang uh, sangat bermanfaat dan uh, bisa menghasilkan. Mungkin juga kita bisa berbagi hal-hal baru dengan cara atau praktek-praktek yang sudah dilakukan kawan-kawan di berbagai tempat di Indonesia dengan riset, ya, tentu, tentu saja. Uh, kami mengucapkan terima kasih sekali lagi kepada Ibnu Nasir sebagai inisiator dan juga moderator untuk acara ini. Juga kepada uh, Profesor Fridus dan rekan-rekan peneliti baik PMB maupun dari luar PMB yang telah menghadiri uh, webinar ini. Untuk mempersikat waktu, saya rasa atau webinar ini saya buka atas nama uh, kapus, Kepala Pusat kami yaitu Profesor Dr. Ahmad Najib Burhani. Uh, yang sebetulnya hadir tapi tidak bisa ikut bicara. Uh, saya rasa webinar ini kita buka dan selamat berdiskusi. Saya kembalikan ke Ibnu. Silahkan Ibnu. Terima kasih Mbak Lilis. Uh, saya kira tadi sudah ada beberapa poin yang di-highlight oleh uh, Mbak Lilis. Uh, sebelumnya saya berterima kasih sekali kepada Pak Fridus sudah bersedia 
untuk uh, berbagi seperti yang tadi disebutkan bagi pengalamannya. Kebetulan memang ketika saya terpikir untuk menginisiasi diskusi ini uh, karena tahu bahwa ketika awal pandemi uh, Pak Fridus sedang ada di lapangan uh, di Indonesia ketika itu. Uh, jadi sudah ada catatan mengenai apa yang harus dilakukan dalam situasi yang sebenarnya lumayan uh, unprecedented. Nah, uh, bagi yang belum kenal, uh, Pak Fridus saat ini adalah uh, senior researcher di KITLV, sekaligus juga profesor uh, bidang Maluku di uh, Free University di Belanda. Nah, uh, diskusi ini sendiri akan dilakukan dalam dua bahasa. Pak Fridus akan sharing pengalamannya menggunakan bahasa Inggris, Tapi nanti eh, jika ada peserta ingin mengajukan pertanyaan atau menceritakan pengalamannya dapat menggunakan bahasa Indonesia, eh, proses diskusinya nanti Pak Fridus akan diberi kesempatan untuk sharing sekitar 25-30 menit untuk kita kemudian punya sejam sampai satu setengah jam untuk melakukan diskusi lanjutan. Nah, um, seperti yang tadi sudah disampaikan oleh Mbak Lilis, kita tahu bahwa pandemi memang mengubah cara kerja banyak orang di berbagai bidang, termasuk penelitian sosial. yang seharusnya sebetulnya uh, amat mengandalkan wawancara di lapangan, interaksi langsung pada manusia. Tapi kemudian kita tahu bahwa di pandemi seperti sekarang, kita terbatas sekali untuk punya interaksi terhadap uh, informan, dan kemudian kita harus mencari siasat-siasat baru bagaimana cara kita untuk mengumpulkan data. Di satu sisi kita ingin menjaga agar pengumpulan data tetap tercapai, target yang kita setuju, kita ingin memahami isu-isu yang uh, sudah kita rancang dalam penelitian kita juga tidak mau kehadiran kita membahayakan informasi diri kita sendiri nah di tengah itu saya kira memang perlu ada semacam strategi yang dilakukan dan untuk itu kemudian kita bisa mempersilahkan untuk Pak Fridus mungkin sharing pengalamannya baik ketika melakukan penelitian lapangan di tengah awal pengumuman pandemi juga tentang murid-muridnya yang kemudian dibimbing sebagai PhD dan punya uh, banyak tugas melakukan penelitian lapangan. Uh, untuk itu saya beri kesempatan kepada Pak Fridus. Ya. Terima kasih Ibu Irnu. Selamat siang semua. Shalom. Uh, uh, um, Irnu, A couple of th- uh, weeks ago, Ibnu asked me to give us a webinar on uh, on the research on in COVID pandemic, and at that point I was a kind of hesitating because I thought I'm not the expert. Uh, I'm not an expert on doing research in COVID times uh, <laughs> because it's it's more on digital work um, in the cyberspace. And then I thought maybe the team of Ibnu itself, who is working on the digital world, is uh, more. experts on uh, on the digital in the digital world and also on the cyberspace so i'm not the expert here it's ibnu and his team who is the experts the only thing that i can do is uh, share some uh, some experiences that uh, that we have uh, and then ibnu said to me you know one of the reasons that uh, he was thinking of uh, of asking me to to join and to, to say something to you uh, to join a, a webinar was that Uh, almost a year ago, uh, well, I think it's more than it, it's a year ago. I wrote a blog together with two students, um, which was called "Fieldwork at COVID-19," <laughs> and it had the title "After a Corona Home Run from from Indonesia." So he said, "You have some experience, and we would like to share this." So I think, okay, let's. I think it's it's a good way of sharing the experience and to uh, maybe to have a, a starting point for a discussion. Uh, and a starting point for thinking further. Uh, and for me, it was also an opportunity to meet f- friends of Filippi that I haven't seen for a long time. And now I see a lot of names uh, and uh, some faces. Uh, so I, at least it feels a little bit like like being at home again, uh, because uh, every year, once or twice, I, I would come to Lippi and then it was felt like Pulang. Uh, so there's at least a little bit uh, in in the COVID. It's like a COVID pulang this this uh, experience. Uh, sorry that I'm speaking in English. Biasanya saya bicara bahasa Indonesia, tetapi kerana masih pagi di Belanda dan saya sudah tidak di Indonesia selama satu tahun dan topiknya itu itu baru untuk saya. Itu lebih baik saya bicara pakai bahasa Inggris because then I can. You know, 
talk a little bit more more easier. But let, let's let's first. So what I want to do is to talk a little bit about the confrontation with uh, and the impact of COVID on on the research that I'm involved with, and maybe it's also broader. Then I will talk about uh, doing research online in the cyberspace. Talk a little bit about a hybrid kind of field work. Then I want to go into some experience of delving online. That means harvesting and trying to find materials online. Uh, then I want to say something about the differences between the uh, online delving uh, and the off offline delving. Uh, I want to say something about field visits. Uh, and then I, I will end with some experiences of, uh, of doing interviews in COVID time. Uh, and one of the things that I'm, I'm working on, or, or I regularly uh, uh, give lectures and, and courses on uh, oral history and interviewing. And of course, this is different in COVID times. So there was some, so I, I discussed last week with my students about their experiences. And I think that's good. One of the things that's, that's good to, to discuss with you. But let's first, so um, the confrontation and the impact of COVID. It, it was suddenly there. Nobody was expecting it, of course. It was in March 2020 uh, when it really became apparent that there was something happening that we that was influencing our, our lives. Um, and there were students of us. They were all over the world. Uh, I'm teaching at Anthropology. So they were doing fieldwork all over the world. Uh, two of my students were at that time, master students were in Indonesia, one on Bali. The other one was on, uh, on Ambon. Uh, and uh, there was a kind of, not really panic, but it was the idea of what should we do? Should we call them home? Uh, should, they, should we force them come, to come home? Should we um, let them decide themselves? Because maybe they can better uh, understand what's happening in the, the local situation when it comes, when it com is compared to, to our position in the Netherlands. And one of the things that I was thinking at, at, that came to my mind at that time was uh, the, and it was a, a kind of pandemic, but it's not a pandemic like it's now the COVID-19, <clears throat> but there was this pandemic of SARS in 2003. Um, 2003, it was the time that we started together with Lippi, a, uh, a large project called uh, Recording the Future, recording daily life in, in Indonesia at eight locations. And then suddenly there was this SARS. And when you went to an airport, they, you had to, to check your temperature, uh, a lot of people were wearing, wearing uh, mouth masks, um, but so what? What was a kind of token that we thought that was going to be a pandemic didn't turn out to become a pandemic, uh, but it was there. So it's it's. Uh, by the way, just a small advertisement. If you want to see how people reacted on that on 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 the SARS at that in that period and how people talked about it, you just have to go to the archive of recording the future, and you will see how people react, respond to it. So what is the impact of, of a, a possible or uh, pandemic at that point in, the, in, in history? And so, it, and at that time, SARS was just passing by. So in a way it was, it was influencing also my, my perspective of what we should do with the students, should we force them to come home or not? And I thought, I was at that time, it was in Indonesia uh, and I could, I could decide whether or not, uh, because I could see what's, what's the possible, the, what were the options. So we had a lot of discussion about this in the, in the, uh, at the university. And at the end, we just uh, decided to, um, to ask everybody to come, to come home because it uh, slowly all governments started to <laughs> lock down or to close, uh, to make it more complicated or to put uh, restrictions on, uh, on traveling and, and so on. And by the way, uh, at that point, when there was not yet a official um, pandemic going on, it was already influencing my field work in Indonesia because I was supposed to be in Lippi in April 2020, uh, yeah, 2020, uh, and to make a new uh, MOU and to talk about and to start do the, the next uh, round of filming. But then at that time, Lippi already decided not to uh, welcome foreign researchers. And I still remember Ibu Nathi said to me, well, I'll just postpone a couple of weeks and then you come and then we can continue. Well, 
thank you Ibu Narti, but weeks became almost a year. <laughs> so I'm not blaming you, but it's it's how we we I think it's good to think uh, to the, that how, how we were at that point in 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 the process. Um, so there was some signs that <clears throat> it was going to be more sincere. So then we asked the students to come home, <clears throat> and <clears throat> and then <clears throat> suddenly we it's you're confronted with the uh, <clears throat> the impact of where the students are, like the one in, uh, who was uh, doing research in Ambon, for her, it was, it, it was a kind of far away because she had to first go to, uh, to Jakarta uh, and Ambon was still lively. Jakarta was already silent uh, before she could leave to the, to the Netherlands. But also the one who was in Bali, which is kind of more uh, regular connected with, uh, with Europe uh, by airplanes, uh, it was complicated for her to, to leave um, because there was already very much impact on, on the uh, on the schedules of uh, of the trains. Uh, sorry, of the of the planes. So, but <clears throat> luckily they came home <coughs> within uh, within a couple of weeks, <coughs> and they already finished their field work. So they had enough material to write their thesis. But <coughs> so it's a sudden sudden confrontation with the with the uh, uh, with the COVID. And also the impact was that we could not continue doing our research. They could not continue. They were finished, so they had their materials, they had their data, they, they could go into the next phase of writing. But there were other researchers, uh, research projects, which were really um, bothered by this whole uh, uh, COVID-19. Uh, like I said, um, we have this uh, shared project called, we cooperate in the Recording the Future project. And for really field visiting, there's no alternative. So we really had to stop uh, continuing this uh, um, this project of recording the future until the, the it, it's 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 possible again to enter the field uh, physically before we can we can restart the the project. So there's really a kind of hard stop on on that. In the Netherlands, I'm involved in other research projects for among them. For example, a research project that is uh, on the violence of the Dutch between 1945 and 1949, and uh, this, it's a historical project. Um, we do interviews. We do uh, we interview people. Uh, we collect ego documents, not only in the Netherlands but also in Indonesia, uh, and we do a lot of colleagues of mine do a lot of archival work. But also the archives were closed, so it's not <laughs> just going to physically to the to the field, uh, which became uh, complicated, but also the archives, because the archives became closed <clears throat> when it took longer and the lockdowns took longer, uh, they started to open up, but it was only just bits and pieces. So it's the the, the richness of the materials are uh, are less for the the researchers who are working during the um, during the, the COVID uh, period. Um, me, myself, I'm, I'm working on this project in this whole program and we call witnesses and contemporaries where we collect these eco documents and also do some interviews. Um, but we could not, so one of the, so we were confronted with the problem that we could not continue doing interviews with older people because especially older people are the most vulnerable people when it comes to COVID. So we have to be really protective for the people that we want, would like to interview. One of the things that we were using is what you can call it witness seminars. Other people call it focus group. Uh, so you bring together a group of people that because you bring them together, there's more dynamic in the interviews. And there are two reasons why this kind of focus group discussions or this witness seminars couldn't be continued because, the, uh, because of the fact that you bring together more people and especially in our project, it were older people. So we were really limited to uh, to to collecting <coughs> the stories of um, of people, so in, in in that sense, really were hampered by the the whole COVID uh, time. Later on, we <coughs> we could start doing some interviews, but then it's a one to one uh, setting, <coughs> and we have to be very careful and take uh, precautions before we could uh, could do that. So that's the confrontation, and so in a way, <coughs> although we didn't know beforehand that it was going to be that sincere, uh, I think a lot of research came to a stop. So it's really stopped and we have to wait until we continue 
or we have a lack of a lot of information. We don't have uh, access to that many sources that we used to have. And I think like uh, <clears throat> for most of the projects that I'm working on, uh, it meant that uh, the results and the publications <clears throat> will be uh, will be delayed. So uh, publications that were supposed to be there um, in, um, what is it, in, in the end of 2021, Will only be published six months later. It's it's really really having an impact on the um, <clears throat> it's really having an impact on the on the research of the of the of the research. So let's go to the <clears throat> online world because when we don't we're not able to go to <clears throat> to do uh, work in the physical uh, in a physical uh, environment. We have to do it online. We have to go to the to the, to the cyberspace, so to say. Um, as an anthropologist, uh, it's something that I'm already advocating for a long time. Uh, I always say that if you nowadays, if you want to do research as, a, as an anthropologist, um, and maybe not only the anthropologist, but also social scientists, and whenever you're working with people, uh, we should include the online world because uh, nowadays the people are not just living in the offline world. The online world is very important. Uh, we have discussions on how we have to uh, include uh, social media and there's discussions and I think in the digital anthropology <coughs> they already have <coughs> uh, extended debates on how to work with uh, with this uh, online online world I think that's that the team of Ipmo, uh is, is doing that let's say every, it's everyday work of uh, of the team of, uh, of Ipno uh, so ideas of if you look at the at uh, social media uh, there's is, is, is it the front stage or is it the backstage? You know, how do we have to interpret what's going on? What kind of uh, platforms are there? Um, and it's it's something that I always try to convince my students to <coughs> include this uh, the the, on, the online world. Um, and what I noticed until now that uh, many of them, you know, they would like to look at social media, but for them it was more fancy, more more thrilling. To meet people in real person, so there is a kind of, you know, we we were acknowledging the importance of the <clears throat> online world of cyberspace, but we tended not to fully incorporate it in our in our uh, in our researches. So it's it's a kind of um, uh, yeah a difficult relationship. And now, because of the uh, limitations in doing research on the physical uh, world. Uh, we are forced into doing work with uh, the uh, the cyberspace, uh, but it means that we also have to learn new new languages. Uh, and with new languages, I don't mean <clears throat> it's a, it's a real language, but it's it's the language of the social media. It's the language of, of websites. We have to learn more. So that I think the digital anthropologists already know, but a lot of other anthropologists they are forced to think about what does it mean? How do you read tweets? Um, who is who? What is the what is the sound uh, of the use of of, of pictures in in tweets uh, or in in Facebook? What are the dynamics of threats? Uh, for example, if somebody put a post, there is a reaction, and then somebody somebody comes in, and they, the discussion is going a kind of polarized direction, and that will lead to people uh, silencing. So how can we read silences in posts on Facebook, tweet, Instagram, and so on? So it's we have to learn. Uh, it's it's like <clears throat> when you start to use more physical work, uh, you have to learn the uh, language of image, uh, and now we have to learn the language of uh, social media. And there's another thing that we were more confronted with. And that's uh, when you come from the digital anthropology, um, there were two, let's say, two uh, recognized directions. Uh, people would do, choose to be full in the cyberspace. So you're doing research fully in the cyberspace. Um, and then <clears throat> there was this, this uh, then there was another direction was more oriented on working on digital technology uh, and social media and then to contextualize this in the on, in, in the offline world. So how does somebody use <coughs> the um, what is it? How does, how does somebody use the 
uh, social media or digital technology uh, coming from, from the offline world. Uh, and now we are forced to, in, in a way, to make it more hybrid. Uh, we, are, we are forced and we have to think about a, a third way <coughs> where we are talking about including online and offline uh, field sites as, as, a, as comparative. So it's, in a way, this, this COVID uh, condition forces us as a social anthropology of, or uh, social sciences or uh, anthropologists uh, to think more of the online and offline fields or dimensions of somebody's life as, as integrated because we are forced to make a step out of this online world to more the, uh, the offline world. So I think it's, it's uh, it, I think it's a, a benefit. So we are forced to do this and now we are, <coughs> we are going to think more about a uh, hybrid kind of uh, field work and uh, the, the question will be for the long, the question will be for the long run uh, if we how we can uh, how we can uh, do this. Um, so we we probably will go and then it it means that at the end we will end up with a kind of holistic approach in which every social scientist or anthropologist will think of when he's doing it, he or she is doing research that he or she should include the cyberspace, the online world, the offline world, but also the social media and all the, uh, the dig digital uh, uh, technology. <clears throat> but it's complicated. Uh, it's complicated um, at the moment, especially. Uh, so we know we are thinking more about it, but it's complicated at the moment because uh, we have these lockdowns. Uh, it's, it's, it's complicated because we have not so many physical meetings. When I look at my at my students, so when I did this uh, <clears throat> this year, we started with uh, um, a new batch of uh, bachelor students, and when we did this, uh, and then normally at the f uh, at the food, we will we call it a bachelor project. We will offer them some uh, topics uh, or ideas uh, that they can do their research on, and uh, to make it yeah easier and to. To, to make sure that they, they can manage in time. Um, and so what, what we did this year, or what I did this year, I offered some topics that are really connected with the, with the cyberspace. So it's, it's online communities. And of course, um, so it, because that's, that's where we have to start. We, don't, we have lockdown in the Netherlands already for six months. And then before that, we had uh, earlier lockdown. Uh, so we have to think about offline, of online, uh, online communities. And then at the moment I have four bachelor students and I see that some of them, uh, although we started with thinking of offline, I'm sorry, online communities, um, all of them try to find a way of also going to the physical uh, part because that's the most interesting for, for most of the anthropologists. And then it becomes the offline, so the in-person meetings become a kind of, uh, bonus. If you if you are capable to organize it, then it becomes a kind of bonus. But it's a bonus that can add very much to to the results of the of the. Uh, so it's a kind of the emphasis on the on the online, and then the rest will be a kind of a kind of bonus. And it really depends on uh, networks of the individual researcher or student. So one of my students. She's doing research on what they call natural hair movement. Um, so it's it's uh, for uh, black women of color or black women, uh, and because she self see herself is part of this community, for her it was it was uh, possible to do some some uh, live interviews. Uh, another student who lives in a small village, doing research on a specific Moluccan community, um, she could do these interviews because. She did. She could do some interviews because it's in in, in her local village, she, but she could not go farther away. So it's it's really the, yeah. there's a, a, a limitation on this. Um, there's a, a limitation on that, um, but we are forced to, to combine it, and I think that's that's uh, we should should take the moment to to do this, <clears throat> to to make this uh, this combination. So I think it's we are forced to think about this hybrid field work. Uh, hybrid in the sense of uh, field, field sites. I think that's good that we have to uh, 
uh, uh, at this moment we we are not capable yet because of the COVID to really uh, ex explore that and to develop that. At the same time, we can start to learn what I call delving online. So it's it's uh, it's it's the next point I want to say something about. What do I mean with the delving online? If we talk about cyberspace, if we talk about offline communities, um, in fact, what's happening there is that there is a uh, <coughs> there is a um, it, it, there's an uh, an archive. There's a uh, uh, an offline archive. Uh, how do I how do I get to this? And what I mean with it, uh, uh, on, uh, an online archive is, for example, there are Facebook groups uh, that are connected with the communities that I want to study. Uh, how do I and the, the postings, uh, the discussions? In fact, they are material that we can use for uh, for our research. How do you get to this stuff? Uh, this last week, uh, when I met my bachelor students, uh, I. We discussed this because I said, I want to pick your brains for sharing with my Indonesian colleagues. Uh, and then I said, how, how do you learn to delve in this digital, uh, in this cyberspace? And then one of my students said, I don't know how to explain, but I'm a native on the online world. <laughs> <laughs> so she was playing the age, the card of age. I'm 65, she is 27. <laughs> and she said, I, I already started to use internet when I was four years old. Sure. Uh, so, okay, there's a difference between natives or indigenous uh, cyberspace inhabitants and all the people coming from the stone age, the paper age, like me. Uh, but still, I want, to, I, want, I want to learn. I think I can. Uh, but how, how are you going to do this? Because there are some, uh, I think it's important because it's, when we learn to understand the language of uh, cyberspace in its all different uh, forms, uh, <laughs> then it's, it become, will become a rich, uh, rich material. But then we have to think really, internet is not static. It's a dynamic, uh, it's a really dynamic world. And I think, I hope to, to I, in fact, I hope that I'm, I'm provo provoking uh, Ipno and his team to say something about this later. So I, I, I learn as a non-native uh, cyberspace inhabitant, <laughs> I hope to learn a little bit more. Um, for example, is, is if the, uh, there is a group in the Netherlands, uh, a Moroccan uh, organization, uh, and they are, um, let's say very outspoken when it comes to uh, specific um, uh, parts of the Dutch uh, history, for example, Jan Pieterson Koen, who, killed, who did the massacre at Banda uh, Islands in, in, in Maluku in 1621. Um, and they, they can be a kind of, so tear this statue down. They want to break the statue down and they, they post this on, on, on their Facebook. And at some point, one of, my, one of the people I know from this organization was expelled from Facebook. She was because she was considered to be a terrorist. Which I, I'm not. She's not. But it's it's because of the words, she was kicked out of of Facebook as a as a terrorist. There's another one uh, within this. I'm I'm doing a lot of research on post-colonial migrants on Moluccans in the Netherlands. There's another group who is uh, for me very interesting. Uh, but the the one who's write, writing on the Facebook and on in in the website is changing the content every time, all the time. So what is when do I start harvesting? How do I get to to the to the to the material? And how can I, uh, I how can I keep this uh, without being dependent on uh, on Facebook uh, or postings or tweets or um, and so on? Uh, I think so. There's 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 a thing that we have to to learn. There are some tools like maybe you have heard about it. Uh, like the Wayback Machine, uh, but the Wayback Machine is a kind of repository of old websites, um, and there and it's not it's not guaranteed full. So you can find something if you know the old URL, uh, but otherwise you will not you will not find anything. But and then it's it's just parts of it what you what you can find. So the delving online is something that's. Uh, 
uh, <clears throat> what is it? Uh, it the delving online is something that's that's that 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 is important to to explore uh, to explore more. Um, also, like uh, we'll come to that later, um, and having access to online platforms is something uh, that that can be complicated. One of my students wanted to have access to closed community pages because when you depend, you know, if you can go to a physical event, you go there, you buy a ticket, and you go in. <clears throat> but now you have to uh, you have to ask to to what is it to access a community case take some time five days before allow you in. That's what she told me. Uh, as I said, well, they don't even care about really if you want to go in, but it's 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 like a control. But at the same time, I think it's 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 a replica of the real world. If you want to go into an archive, and you want to uh, go into a meeting hall, uh, you and you have to request for material. It also takes some time. So it's there's no no difference between online and offline. The only thing is that. I think if you're trying to do it online, it feels more frustrating because it, you know, you just click and you think you can go very fast. Uh, and we are accept uh, waiting time for the the offline world and not for the online world. <clears throat> One of my students said when she was doing uh, a more, uh, she was investigating the backgrounds of one of the her interlockers. And she said, and she found out that uh, this uh, person that she wanted to interview had a really long history of tweeting. Um, and then she said, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I saw this long tweets and for me, it, it's interesting because it says something about this person, but also about the discussions in which this interlocker is, uh, is involved. But the problem is that some of the tweets are deleted. So they're not complete anymore. They're not there all anymore. So how can I, what, how can I deal with it? And I think that's, that's, it's the problem with all, all, all archives. So in that sense, it shows us the, that um, of the online archives of tweets of posts are the same as the paper archives. Because okay. if you look at the paper, if you look at the paper archives, you always have to, to think and to find okay. out uh, which is still there, or uh, <clears throat> whether or not something is uh, is already deleted before it's put in the in the archive. And I think every historian will know about this. So there is a kind of same uh, thing, same same limitations of the of the archives uh, if it's online or it's offline. But there's something extra, I think, in the in the online archives, and that's the algorithms. If you if you go to an archive, a paper archive, you know you can go to the to the catalog, uh, but there's no catalog for the internet. Uh, you're depending on the algorithms of your your search uh, search engine. Um, you're depending on the algorithms of uh, of the platforms. Let, let me give you an example. Uh, with the recording in the future, one of the places that we film is uh, in Campo Malayo, just close to Chilibu. In Jakarta, um, in two thousand eight, or yes, I think it's two thousand eight, uh, we made uh, small clips from uh, also from this uh, Kampung Malayo. We put it on YouTube, and YouTube was connecting these two other uh, clips video of Kampung Malayo, uh, and it was funny. But it was not funny. It was, it was it was enriching because you know we were filming there just on, for a, 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 one day, <laughs> but then suddenly. Uh, there was it was linked with clips where you could see, see Jokowi uh, at that time uh, uh, governor of Jakarta uh, using the Chili Wong as a, a platform for campaigning. You could see students using the Chili Wong as a platform to uh, discuss about the waste and uh, environmental issues. Um, it was put there by YouTube. Who is going to take care that the clips will be there? In the future, who is going to take care that I can find the same uh, clips if I want to? If I'm not, you know, putting the links at this moment, even if I would write down the hyperlinks, the hyperlinks may change because they are not unique. Uh, they may change because somebody is moving its platform or website from one provider to another provider. So there's a kind of kind of problem, and we have to reckon with these algorithms. Uh, so there's this this uh, extra. 
uh, influence on uh, doing research in uh, in the online in the cyberspace uh, where we are not not aware or where we don't have control on and it's something that we have to think and uh, probably there are some some answers how to deal with it or maybe just accept that uh, sometimes we cannot find that what we found earlier so Delphi online it's, it's something that we start at least I and my student we started to explore and to think more uh, forced by this COVID um, because we started to do more on, on online but then anthropologists want to do field visit they want to observe uh, how are we doing this so what's what's about field visit uh, like I said recording in futures came to a stop for the moment <clears throat> because we cannot visit the field and it's that's a large project uh, but also for smaller uh, research like what I said this student of mine who's doing research on natural hair movement for her it would be interesting to go to a barber shop hang out ask why people come there uh, explore their backgrounds talk about it mobile you know it's it's that's the, the way anthropologists are are working and the barber shops are now open. well if they are open you have to make an appointment for for uh, uh, you have to make an appointment they are not allowed to have <coughs> to be too many people inside there are no live events where you can go meet up with people um so it's 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 limited and you have to go to uh online events you have to go to to you have to really think more carefully of how to connect with people um <clears throat> that you don't know uh, don't know yet um i think that there are two uh who could at least find some people but then it's it's depending on on, on the networks uh, to do some interviews with but really going to to places it's it's complicated one of my stu master students uh did research recently in in uh, uh in Sulawesi he's Indonesian uh but he was confronted with COVID because it was he himself became ill so he could not go to all places that he wanted uh so you see that it's it's limited and then you really depend on uh, the quality of the case cases that you can you can reach. So the, in a way, you have to try in a way to, uh, if you have the possibility to do a kind of really physical phase, uh, physical research, then you have to take into account that maybe the, the the quantity of the of the cases that you're doing is less, but your the quality should be more uh, stressed. So it would be. Um, and then, of course, it's it's uh, one of my B, a bachelor students also became ill, and then it's complicated because it's uh, you know how do you connect to other people when you're ill and you're sitting home and you're depending on on the internet to um, so it's it's really making uh, constant uh, decisions in the during your field work on how to to deal with the limitations that you're confronted with and you don't know for the next time maybe you cannot travel because you have this negative. Or you have you should have a, a negative uh, test result um so it's really it it can be influencing also while you're doing the research uh, one of my PhD students she's working on refugees in Italy uh, and she wanted to see how the refugees in Italy uh, coming from North Africa uh, were received and how they let's see the 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 emergency measures that were taken would become a kind of regular measures but because of COVID, she could not go anywhere. There was a lockdown, so in fact, whole the whole fundament of her uh, her research changed. Uh, well, disappeared, and she had to think about how to reframe her uh, her research. So one other thing that she did is she started to think about what is the impact of COVID on the reception of refugees in Italy. So it's a kind of temporary, and I think it can be interesting, but it's. It's another kind of uh, so it really asks very much uh, flexibility of uh, of the researchers. Then, okay, you, there are no no physical meetings, but how can you connect in Zoom meetings? You know, when I look around, I see a lot of names, uh, some faces with pictures. Some people are moving, so they are not pictures in the in the small monitors. But how can we connect? uh where, and all or the names that i see 
are that the names of the real people or are they using their wives or their husbands uh, or maybe their children's computers so i see the names of uh the children instead of somebody else so it's it's complicated to connect and to see really in what environment i'm at the moment for example i'm i'm, I'm talking uh one of my students um she has an, her last name, her family name, is the same name as a, a Dutch city, Leerdam. Uh, and she was attending a Zoom meeting with uh, Moluccans. Uh, and people saw her name, Leerdam. And then, so she's, uh, so then somebody asked her, are you coming from this city? Because in that city, there's a Moluccan community. So it's a, they thought it's a nickname. You know, it's like Friedes from Amsterdam. Uh, so ah, you're 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 and you know when there are Moluccans in Amsterdam, they would say, "Oh, you're a Moluccan from Amsterdam." No, I'm not. But it's, it's my for her. It was it was a coincidence, and she wanted to get contact with these people, and because they thought that she was Moluccan coming from this village, uh, she she could connect. But so there's something there. This an, there's anonymity, uh, but it's a different kind of anonymity uh, when you compare it to physical meetings. So it's. You have to really think about how to how how to connect. Then then we have ethical problems. Um, what are are we allowed? So if if you're a researcher, you know in the nowadays we try to because of the privacy laws and integrity laws, uh, we always say we have to be open that we are researchers. We have to make sure that people know that we're doing research, so they can you know they can reject or they can uh, make their comments on it. How do you, how do we open ourselves as a researcher? So uh, at this moment, uh, there are 89 participants. There are 80, 89 participants in, in this meeting. If one of you, well, there, most of you are researchers, I know, but if one is now doing research, should he or she say, I'm doing research? Ask 89 people, or how does it work? So it's there's a kind of ethical ethical problem, um, and if you're doing and you're going to use uh, remarks of somebody, how do you get your your informed consent? How do you get permission to use this later? It's of course it depends. This depends on the regulations of the when you're doing research and and, and of your of your uh, your university or your institute. Uh, but it's something that you really have to think about. Um, can you record? I think this one is recorded. We are on live on YouTube uh, because it's it's announced. Uh, but can, for example, if I would do research, can I record this? And you know, just I don't have to do it official. I just can do it with my handphone, uh, like I can do it outside. But then, how does it? How does it? How does it? How does it work? So there's a lot of uh, problems in in this, um, and then this is streamed. Uh, and it's recorded. Is is the if if what the meeting that we have now, is this a public meeting? As soon as this is on the is streamed, is it in the public domain? Uh, are people allowed to use it or not? So we, because we are because of this pandemic, we are doing more and more Zoom meetings, uh, events, Zoom events, uh, and and because we want we, we're not. You know, we cannot let 300 people come in uh, and they would take their notes down and they would write about it. But now we are putting it on the internet uh, because we're streaming it and we are, we're doing it uh, online. We're doing it digital. Uh, so it means that there's a new dimension also in this in these meetings. And as an anthropologist, uh, I, I, re, I can go to a lot of meetings without being there. So I just can go through the internet and I can find these online meetings and the streamings still there, which I can use for my research. But how much am I allowed to do this? Because they didn't make this research, these meetings for my research. I didn't say to them that I'm going to use it. Is it public or is it not? So the, it, the discussion on the, on, on the status of, of uh, what's, what is online. Okay, let's, <clears throat> well, that's, that's about me. But then when it comes to interviews, that's the last uh, thing that I want to discuss for for a short moment. Uh, <clears throat> if we are not, if we can, we cannot 
interview people in life. Uh, what is the options of doing this online uh, or uh, through media or uh, mediated? Um, there's some literature on it. And uh, <clears throat> because I, when I give this methodology on oral history, <clears throat> I, was, I was looking at how to, how much <clears throat> there is on, on uh, literature also on, on uh, doing interviews online. Some people say that there is some right that there's not a real difference. But, so there was some, one of the, the articles that I, I came up to was comparing uh, two, uh, two researchers in which they both used in online and in-person uh, interviews. And they would say that the results were more or less the same. So there's no influence of doing online research, uh, interview. Um, but I think it's it depends on, on what kind of uh, topic you have. Of course, there is a benefit, you know, what we call the environmental footprint is less. So if, if I want to do interviews in, in the north of the Netherlands, I don't have to go by car. So I am not polluting, I'm polluting the, uh, less pollution. Or even I want to do interviews in Indonesia, I don't have to go to Indonesia. Uh, so I don't have to take the plane. Uh, this is an article from the United States when they say we don't have to go to the other states. Um, so that's that's one thing. Um, and then another one is that uh, how do you work with uh, what we nowadays want to have these consent forms? How do you, do we need signatures of people or can we depend on dig dig digital uh, signatures or orally spoken uh, agreements to be interviewed and where the interviews can be used for. Uh, I think it will something that will develop to because that's 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 going to be more and more uh, the case. <clears throat> uh, but at the same time, we're really depending on the capability of our interviewees, our interlocutors, if they can handle the techniques. You know, it's it's when I started to do research a uh, long time ago. Uh, people would say you have to be careful with your recording equipment because if you have in recording all the people who are not familiar with recording equipment, they will be afraid or there will be something you know influencing the interview. And I think for me, I think it's it's mostly it's it's nonsense. But now we are because if I handle the equipment okay, then it's no problem. <clears throat> but now we are really dependent on our interviewees. Some you know. Like I said, you've got these natives in, in cyberspace. Uh, can we expect from a 90 year old person to handle Zoom uh, or to, uh, to, you know, so there's, it's, it's becoming for much, much more complicated. And then the question <clears throat> whether or not uh, people will go more in depth, uh, can you do more in depth interviews? Uh, what kind of topics can you discuss uh, when you're doing online interviews? I think it's something uh, that the last word's not said about because we still have to think about it and we still probably still have to, to uh, what is it? To experiment with, not experiment with it, but to, to evaluate the different kind of, uh, kind of interviews. <clears throat> um, at least the examples that I saw until now is uh, that uh, when it comes to interviews in which you can build a, uh, a good relation beforehand in a good way so there is a kind of you know you already know somebody or when the conditions are good then it can it can help uh, then it, it should not really be a problem <laughs> but um, when it comes to sens sensitive topics um, or when it really comes to life story then it's it's very important to to have this rapport this relation first established and uh, probably also live interviews would be uh, better because it's it's you've got more you've got more more control. But still, it's it's not always possible. Like we're in the lockdown, uh, and how are we dealing with it? If you're not capable or doing of doing something, uh, of, of going to to a, a, an in person interview. So let me share you some of the of the experiences of uh, of one of my students, my bachelor students, who did uh, interviews online, um, just recently. She said one of one of the things that <coughs> making rapport, like trying to establish a, a communal 
base for the interview uh, was talking about Corona because everybody's affected by Corona. And the fact that you're doing the interview online is uh, the impact of Corona. So it was something to, to talk about and to show that you're interested in the other one. So how does Corona affect your, impact your life? Uh, this is my experience, this is your experience. So it, it was a way of finding a kind of, <clears throat> a kind of uh, uh, basic thing. Then she said, I started to realize that I had to make extra steps before I contacted people. Because if I'm, you know, if I'm going to interview in field, in person, I, uh, I, I would try to get some more information about people. I, do, I ask other people. I, 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 maybe I already uh, meet somebody in the field during a meeting uh, or during a, uh, on, on the streets and I have a chit chat. A chit chat helps me to understand this person to build up a relationship. Well, we don't have this possibility, this option in the in the COVID time. So I said I had to rely more on uh, on what I can find about a person on social media. Uh, so she was going to look through the social media, Instagram, uh, how to uh, Facebook, how to see what is what are the things that the, these people are interested in. What are the things that they think are for them is is important. But at the same time, because she was looking through the socials of her potential interlockers, uh, she realized that if she would contact this interviewee or this, this interlocker, that the interlocker would also check on her. So she a kind of remodeled her own social media to uh, make sure that uh, it would kind of connect with the uh, with the, the the respondent, so if the the interviewee would check on her, that the interview would recognize something. Okay, and then we can ask: Is this is this ethical? Because is this manipulating or is this ethical? And I think it doesn't. It's again, it's not very different from the real world. If I'm going to, if I want to do an interview with somebody, and I meet up, you know, to make to make a first connection uh, and there's something that I don't like about this person, I will not say so. I will show the freedoms that I think they want to see. So I will, I will act like they would like me and therefore they would agree to have an interview. And that's the same you have to do on the end. But you have to, you have to think that, you know, when I meet somebody in person, I'm in total control. But if they are going to check my, my socials, I'm not in control. I have to change. I have to, maybe I have to do something with my socials. So it's, it's, so the mechanisms are the same. Uh, so it's, and, and therefore I think it's, it's the ethical, but it's something that you have to think about. And then she said, <clears throat> uh, then there was something during the interviews. One of the things that I'm always teaching is that if you're doing interviews, silences uh, are okay. It's no problem to, to that there is a, a silence uh, because it, it helps the, it let the, the interviewee think, to give the option to think, to uh, reformulate uh, and so on. But then <clears throat> my student said, the problem if you're doing uh, interviews online, if there's a silence, you panic because maybe the, the connection is freezed. Maybe something is wrong with Wi-Fi. Maybe uh you know, she's muted uh so there can be something technical because you you know you're not sitting upset opposite to somebody there's the, the, so then the first thing is that you oh something can, technically is going wrong so you're more distracted by 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 this but at the same time this technical issue she said you can use to uh ask uh to repeat the answer and then sometimes they will they will repeat the answer, but in a different way, more extended. Because you can sorry, something went wrong. There's there's some words missing. Can you repeat? And it's accepted. It would not be accepted if I'm sitting opposite to you. <laughs> I would say, I'm I'm interviewing Ibnu. Ibnu was talking to me, and then I say, Ibnu, sorry, I didn't hear you. Then you would think, what is the guy doing? He's not listening. 
no, if now if you would say something to me and I would say, I didn't hear you, then you think, oh, it's the connection and you will repeat and it's, and it's accepted. So you can use it in a way as a, as a, as a tool. So blame this technical discomfort to repeat the question and, and get a renewed answer. <clears throat> but then there's something else. Interviewing is interaction. And the interaction through media, through online, is it's very limited. How do we sense more about the social accepted answers? Um, how do we how do we see uh, body language? You know, I'm when I'm little, I, I can use my hands now because I'm far enough from from the screen. But there's a problem. It's a, I I cannot even if I'm one to one in an in an in an setting in online uh, there's a limitation because my camera is different is has a different position compared to my screen so i'm looking at my screen to face the one who's opposite to me but my camera is taking me from a different angle so i don't have eye to eye contact i will never have eye to eye contact um, so it's something else and so it's it's the the body language if 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 i'm if i try to convinced well to to support uh, an interview by bending over and showing more interest bending over is something that your body can do when you see the whole body if it's not there then you have to be more special have more expression in, in your in your face for example so there should be how can you express this more uh, no eye contact how, how can you improve the interaction i think Last year we did we learned a lot of uh, <clears throat> we did a lot lot of uh, uh, what is it um, we had a lot of uh, connections through through media so we are learning but it's something really you have to be uh, conscious about and then it's I'm talking about interviews that we're doing when we see people because we have we're using Zoom we're using Meet Meet or <clears throat> other uh, <clears throat> or we're using other uh, means we, we have uh, video calls but then of course there's there's the option of, of doing telephone calls uh, but then it's becoming even more complicated and probably some of you have some some uh, <clears throat> some experience with that um, okay let let me wrap up it's already 10 o'clock uh, I spoke longer than I intended to do uh, wrapping up what is what is uh, what what did we learn or what something that I have to uh, I thought thinking about I think one of the uh, things is <clears throat> that uh, and 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 I think that's that's a benefit of of the the COVID uh, is that we were forced to think more and explore more in the in the cyberspace uh, so it's something that we started to work with on uh, something that we already longer wanted to do uh, <clears throat> but now it's we're there I think we are forced by this um the COVID to to at least let's say the 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 researchers who were not yet on the cyberspace they are they're doing it more there there were some already working it but we are we are forced to it. uh and i think it it it, it will have a it has, has a positive effect <clears throat> cyberspace is part of, of our lives social medias are there already for a long time and social media is the new way of communicating flyers new communication tools and i think it's good to be forced to look at it and i think it's also it will help us to to combine this digital communication cyberspace it will be more hybrid um and i think in some so to some extent we will keep on using online interviews uh we will make a decision which one is important to be more in uh, person and which one will be uh be also uh, doable in, in uh, online. So we, we have more tools in that sense. I think it, it will help us, it, it shows us and it, and, it, and it will motivate us to have more, uh, to learn new languages, uh, the, the, the facial language, the body language of the, of the, of the, of the face, um, the language of, uh, of Twitter, Facebook, social medias. Um, and we have to learn about the algorithms and the impact of algorithms uh of when we want to do this uh, online uh, delving uh we also will probably learn better to hang out in cyberspace you know 
having the Zoom, Zoom meetings and then uh, understand better who is behind the names and the, and the pictures. Uh, there's already a lot of that experience and a lot of theory and methodology, but I think we, we, can, we can develop that further. And I'm sure that most of us, um, also older, soldiers, older scholars, who are not natives or indigenous cyberspace inhabitants, like me, we can, we can learn if we are open to this. But hopefully, I hope that uh, when the COVID ends, we can renew our experiences of physical fieldwork, hanging out with real people, sometimes meeting each other in Zoom meetings, but also hanging out in, in, in physical spaces, mobile, observe, and we become fascinated by people, but we will go to this hybrid kind of research. Thank you. Thank you, Pak Fridus. So, uh, ada beberapa hal yang kemudian ingin saya garis bawahi untuk kemudian saya punya satu pertanyaan ke Pak Fridus sebelum saya lempar mungkin ke diskusi yang terbuka. Jadi yang pertama, uh, tadi sudah disampaikan bahwa memang pekerjaan penelitian terdampak betul, terutama penelitian sosial uh, dengan COVID, karena kita jadi tidak punya waktu, tidak punya kesempatan, tidak punya peluang untuk berinteraksi secara fisik, atau sangat sedikit, dan kemudian itu memaksa kita untuk melakukan riset dalam konteks yang lebih hybrid, jadi menggabungkan antara kombinasi online dan offline, um, tapi juga seberapa taraf hybridnya disesuaikan dengan seberapa kita mampu mengakses uh, informan dalam uh, dalam taraf offline. Jadi saya kira kasusnya akan disesuaikan tergantung topik yang uh, dikerjakan. Tadi juga saya kira ada beberapa poin menarik, misalnya Pak Fridus mengingatkan bahkan ketika melakukan online, strategi-strategi yang diterapkan sebenarnya serupa dengan ketika kita melakukan penelitian offline. Misalnya, kita melakukan penyesuaian tampilan media sosial kita agar bisa diterima oleh calon informan. Menyerupai sebenarnya cara kita ketika masuk ke satu wilayah atau satu komunitas dan kita mencoba menyesuaikan entah cara berpakaian atau bahasa tubuh atau cara bicara. Um, juga, kita jadi lebih terlatih uh, untuk membaca body language, dan itu membantu kita sebenarnya untuk menyesuaikan model-model penelitian yang akan datang. Walaupun tentu saja masih ada banyak PR-PR etis yang harus kita jawab dan disesuaikan dengan konteks masing-masing. Uh, I only have one question before uh, I could open discussion uh, with other participants. What do you suggest to the ones uh, that design their PhD proposals without uh, online uh, interviews or online data in mind? at all. Uh, would you suggest them to change it into more inclined uh, to online uh, research or whether you suggest for them to wait or change it to more local research that could be accessible offline? And that's, that's you mean that, that would be in, during the time of the COVID? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think during the time of the COVID, you have to think, uh, yeah, the, during the time of COVID, there are uh, several specific research you cannot do, because as long as you cannot go to a specific place, if you cannot go do interviews, then you should then you should uh, refrain from from it because it's it doesn't make sense. That is the problem I think we were confronted with with our uh, bachelor students uh, because we didn't know how long the, the corona was mm. going to take place. Um, and so for and they had to do their they have to do their research in the the month of april uh, and then they have to write their thesis in in may uh, so because it's 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 a risk if you would make it. so that's i think that that will be uh, so it also means that some of the uh, topics could not so you you cannot do some topics so there, there would if you would have a topic that would include really field work ha sitting in a village it's you cannot do at this at this this moment. Mm. Uh, so then you should should uh, uh, then then you should not you know you should concentrate on online. Um, but then when it comes for after post COVID, uh, I think it's one thing that we learn is that also again depending on the topic after post COVID uh, you should if possible well it's if necessary you have to really think about uh, what the impact is of online. So I can imagine you go to a small village in the Aru Islands and you want to, do you want to start at Adat. Then it's 
probably less important than uh, to include than if you go to Kampung Bolayu uh, with the uh, where uh, where people are using games and using you know, have have different kind of access. Um, but at the same time, if you go to the Aru, Aru Islands and you you're looking at Ada, then you have to think of the uh, that there's a lot of discussion on Adat and Adat communities online. Mm. So don't think that even if you go to Aru, which is kind of remote, right? Mm. It's it's far away. It uh, doesn't mean that, that uh, you should exclude it. So even then you have to take into account this hybrid uh, okay. position. Okay, thank you. Ya, uh, jadi kita buka sesi tanya jawab boleh ditanyakan secara langsung boleh diajukan lewat kolom chat uh, disampaikan nanti nama uh, institusi dan kemudian pertanyaannya you could also ask the questions whether in bahasa or in English um, silakan bisa mengajukan pertanyaan baik di kolom chat maupun uh, atau setidaknya mengajukan nama dulu di kolom chat Oke, okay, kalau belum ada, uh, sementara mungkin saya tanya lagi. Kalau kalau untuk bimbingan Pak Fridus sekarang, uh, apakah misalnya ada yang harus melakukan penelitian lapangan di daerah yang tidak memiliki akses internet dan kemudian uh, bagaimana strateginya? Apalagi? Uh... Um, Is there any of one of any of your students that currently doing PhD research then in regions that uh, don't have any access oh, on internet? Okay. That uh, only access through internet, you mean? Yeah, uh, they don't have any access on internet. So, what is the strategy? I mean, <coughs> uh, is... I think at the moment because it's. Uh, so that's I think that's it's the it's the um, because we we know that COVID is just uh, that, well it's, it's it will be it will stay it stay with us but it will become a kind of regular uh, uh, disease or um, problem uh, <clears throat> so in fact if you're doing research now then you have to think about um, you can you can try to find a way of that that you're Uh, going to uh, at at a later stage you're going to the to the field so okay there's one one PhD student who wants to do research on uh, environmental issues and he should go to uh, some areas uh, where is already there is internet but he will he wants to go there uh, but physically at the moment it's a problem so he kind of to make a schedule in which he put his field work more in the end of, of a speci- uh, his, his field work visit in the end of his research period. So there will be more options to go there. So it's, that's, so that's, that's what, how you can, how you can do it. It depends on whether, how, how much time you have. Yeah. Then you have to refrain. Because it's, there's two things. One, if you want to go to, if you want to go to abroad, You have to have, get access to the country first. So there, in fact, there are two levels. Coming from abroad, you have to have access to the to the country, and then you have to uh, the the op- opportunity to go to a specific village or a region. Okay. Um, ada satu pertanyaan tadi sempat disinggung juga sebenarnya oleh Pak Fridus. Apakah ada perbedaan etika penelitian sosial yang dilakukan secara fisik dengan secara online? Um, uh, interesting question. I don't think there's a difference in ethica. <clears throat> well, it's application is different. So what I mean is, um, ethica is about how you. It's about privacy. It's about integrity. Yeah. It's about how you deal with information. Um, without using a misuse and abuse. Um, and then uh, it means that in fact you are, if you do it online or offline, it's the same. 
but the way you uh, handle with it, it's different. And if, I think, so, and, and what I mean is that like, if we meet in person, I can ask you to sign a letter of consent. If I have an interview online, I have to ask you to have a digital signature. Um, if, uh, if I'm on the street, I make a picture um, then, or film, it's some, then I created it. Mm. But then when I look at the Zoom meeting and I just download, it's not my creation. It's the publication of the one who put it on the internet. So that's, we have to think uh, about the differences, but at the same time, we have to think about the same, that how, how much it's, it's, yeah. it's the same. So the, that's what I tried to, to say when I talked about this uh, mechanisms of uh, how you present yourself. Ya, uh, sedikit kalau boleh saya singgung mungkin diulang sedikit tadi uh, Pak Fridus menyampaikan bahwa etika pada dasarnya tidak ada perbedaan. Saya kira dalam arti tidak kita tetap sebagai peneliti harus berpikir bagaimana tidak meng, apa, menyakiti informan, tidak mengancam informan keselamatan baik fisik maupun mental dan seterusnya. Tapi memang ada persoalan teknis teknis yang berkaitan dengan internet yang harus dipertimbangkan sebagai bagian perbedaan itu. Pertanyaan kedua dari Rahmat Hidayat. Uh, apakah kalau melakukan online interview or digital ar- archive, can we expect it to get rich and deep data, just like yeah, in, so, uh, in yeah. yeah, I think I think the it, it depends for interview. It depends on uh, it depends on on the on the topic. Uh, I think if I'm going to do a sensitive topic or I want to, uh, I and I, I, but it's I I think I have to go to a person in person. Because I want to feel uh, and to express, uh, so I think it's it's. Uh, but when it comes to a more superficial interviews, and so that means that I don't think I'm not yet convinced that online interviews as good as an offline interview. When it comes to digital archive, yeah. uh, I think you can find deep data, because any other borbeda an antara the digital archive than kertas, uh, but. It's it depends on how how good you're doing your archival work. Yeah. Okay. So, a uh, question from Buija: Is there any change in uh, research focus or uh, in films, particularly whether it's changed into <laughs> text or more discourse or theoretical instead of field work? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> there's definitely uh, a, a change in Buija. Uh, because it's it's uh, um, in because of the COVID, people are the topics are more connected to online, so they're going going away from the. Um, but uh, maybe it's not the, really what you ask. Um, so it's yeah, well, it it, it it influences the temas, in the sense that if you're not able if you're not not able to go to a field, uh, then you're more uh, in the online. Uh, and I think at the same time, uh, the online world gives a extra uh, possibility of doing doing research. So it 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 kind of enriches the possibilities of of uh, of looking at at things. And and it's and and it's it's the discourse on theory has to change with it mm. because we cannot you know you cannot study a a, a community or even you cannot ngabisa community daily life if we do not include the the, the cyberspace hmm. because then we it's it's like looking at a, a, a limited uh, and yeah. we have to adjust our theory and that's I think that's what I said we are forced by by uh, we are forced by COVID to include cyberspace and I think it's good because now we have to keep this momentum and keep the cyberspace in our research yeah. Ya, yeah, saya kira itu memang menjadi semakin nyata ya bahwa apa penggunaan uh, cyberspace, penggunaan internet juga jadi bagian penting dalam dalam Betul. kehidupan dan itu mengubah juga diskusi mengenai yes. teori sebenarnya. Um, Oke, okay. pertanyaan dari Nuzul Soleha, uh, jadi di Indonesia dalam beberapa tahun terakhir terjadi bencana, uh, yang paling baru kita sedang ada bencana di NTT uh, yeah. terhadap angin. Bagaimana melakukan riset uh, di daerah yang terkena bencana di tengah pandemi juga? 
I think it's, yeah, it depends. It, it's a problem because <clears throat> the first question you have to ask, uh, how much do you, um, how complicated, uh, how are you making the situation complicated by going there to do research? Mm. Mm. Uh, because there are other things. Then that's that's one thing. But then of course there's also social research on how to deal with disaster. So that's that's it can be very important. And then the, the problem will be uh, yeah about the pandemic. It's uh, uh, it's more complicated because there is an urgency to do some research when it comes to how to deal with the disaster. But at the same time, you have to be very careful. Yeah. Uh, and it, that's yeah. Yeah, saya kira itu pertanyaan yang memang mm-hmm. juga banyak terjadi di awal pandemi, Pak. Ya, ketika kita jadi pertanyaan sebagai peneliti adalah uh, seberapa penting riset kita dibandingkan banyak peristiwa besar yang terjadi di luar dalam hal ini pandemi mm-hmm. dan bencana. Jadi saya kira yeah. pertama adalah prioritasnya keselamatan orang-orang. Yeah, and I think it's it's also it, it points at the fact that pandemi is just one of the issues that mm-hmm. are. Uh, the disasters are also there. Yeah. We don't we don't have to up to blind only focus on the on research. The... Yeah. Um, ya yeah, pertanyaan dari Firna Emily dan Pak Iqbal ini saya kira sama. Jadi um, sosial media seringkali dibayangkan sebagai tampilan yang tidak nyata, tidak asli. Uh, bagaimana kita mengecek reliabilitas dan validitasnya? Kalau dalam bahasa Pak Iqbal, bagaimana rekonsel perbedaan antara perilaku kita di media sosial dengan perilaku kita yang sehari-hari sebenarnya seringkali berbeda? Yeah, I think it's it's uh, I think it's connected to the next question about social media hmm. uh, from Iqbal. Yeah, <coughs> it's it's also about how to trust uh, how to trust the the what what so that's one is it's about So I think that's that's what I try to say about these algorithms. Uh, it's it, it's part that's part of the the issue. Mm. You know, there's so much. One of the things that is that uh, we can we can cooperate more with digital humanities, digital sciences, to deal with the big data, mm. uh, because they. You know, I, once I, I we had a PhD student. Uh, Indonesian PhD student who was working on the big data, uh, and he was also using uh, logging uh, information from Yahoo to see mm. how people are looking. So it, there's a lot of things, and, and I think that's that's something that we cannot escape. So one thing is, of course, we will come in the cyberspace. We are drowning because there's so much, uh, and that's that's how we have to deal with it. Uh, we have to find a way of choosing the things that are most important. And I think one of the things is be very, uh, be, when you make a design, you should be very good, um, make explicit what you want to what you want to know. So if you want to know what you want to know, then you can make a decision which of the large data that you can find are important for your research, which you can have to take with you Then at the same, that, so that's one thing. So it, it reflect on your research question. The other one is that um, you, when you do qualitative research, uh, how how can we say that something is representative? You know, if you start mm. to do interviews, mm. one of the things that we always say is as soon as there's a repetition, so there's nothing new added, then it's 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 representative. So I think that's also one of the things you can look at big data. If it's becoming a repetition. Then it's then you can you have the you have the most important things, but then of course how to uh, to see what is reliable, uh, what's how can you how you know what is the, the what you see <coughs> um, is it the true nature of interest? What's that's what of the what uh, uh, Iqbal asks. Uh, I think that's that's one of the things that I said uh, I called learning learning the languages of cyberspace. Um, Even if I, you know, if if I did research, uh, historical research, and I went to the archive, I have to to be critical. We call the resource critic, <coughs> critical about the resource. Why is it written? Who wrote this? Why is it written like this? What is the hidden agenda? What are the limitations of the sources? And that's something that we have to develop for the cyberspace 
uh, Google, and so on. And the only problem compared of the cyberspace compared to the uh, the old uh, analog archives is that the analog archives as, are not as dynamic as the cyberspace. Mm. Because as soon as you think that you understand cyberspace, defend up again. There's Clubhouse now. How do you work with Clubhouse? How do you work with the next platform? So it's something that you have to keep in race with. Yeah. Uh, mungkin saya sedikit berkomentar soal itu. Saya kira uh, menarik juga untuk melihat relasi antara big data dengan dengan kebenaran perilaku individu itu seperti kajian kuantitatif kualitatif dalam dalam uh, riset sebelum online gitu. Jadi saya kira uh, banyak data yang diambil dari big data bisa menggambarkan tren secara makro. Tapi kemudian kita punya PR sebagai peneliti sosial terutama yang kerja di bidang antropologi. untuk mendapatkan data yang lebih mendalam dengan melakukan interaksi yang lebih uh, mikro dan personal terhadap individu. Ada beberapa paper yang sebenarnya saya baca ketika menyinggung pertanyaan Pak Iqbal tadi, uh, justru kadang-kadang dalam riset yang dilakukan online terbuka apa data, terbuka personality yang sebenarnya tidak mungkin dikemukakan orang di dunia nyata. Jadi misalnya, ada beberapa peneliti di beberapa paper yang mendapatkan data-data yang penting, data-data yang sifatnya personal, yang tidak disampaikan ketika pertemuan di dunia nyata karena merasa canggung, um, tapi malah disampaikan dalam katakan chat di WhatsApp atau chat di Facebook dan uh, lain-lainnya. Jadi ada beberapa contoh sebenarnya uh, kajian yang menunjukkan bahwa sebenarnya kajian online juga bisa mendapatkan data mendalam, Kalau bukan malah kadang dalam konteks tertentu lebih mendalam ketimbang dilakukan wawancara secara langsung. Tapi tergantung kasusnya sekali lagi. Um, ya ada pertanyaan dari Lina, uh, whether information that you could get from lengthy phone interview is valid as an information on research? Uh, yeah, this is a, this is a new soal ya. It's a problem. Well, it, it's not. A, I think, um, if I understand, it's a, a difference between um, conducting an interview on on in, on interview uh, an interview on telephone. Then it's mm. of course it's directed to it. But if you have a long interview, do you can you use it as information? You know, in, mm. in the other mm. two, there are two differences. Um, it, it's it's uh, it's I think it's a, a matter of. Uh, Uh, well, in the ethical point, it's uh, does somebody who that you talk to the phone know that you're doing research, and that then it's somebody could be informed. Uh, and at the same time, you can see that, for example, a lengthy telephone interv- uh, interview or talk on the telephone is uh, how you call it is uh, uh, is like a long chat on the street. So it's, I think it's one of the things that we should do if we use de- de- digital, well, telephone is not, not per se, di- well, nowadays it's digital, but it's, it's, not, it's not about the cyberspace, but we have to, I think one of the important things is always to compare to, uh, to what, we were, what was, was we were used to. So if we have a long interview, uh, well, a long talk on the, interv- uh, on the telephone, is that the same as that we would, see people on the street and then we talk with them for a long time and i would use it for my interviews uh, sorry i would use it for my research so then this talk in the interview on the telephone would be for me also uh, be usable for uh, information as a, as part of my interview uh, research okay um ada pertanyaan dari wedra how do you find a novelty Uh, on research or article, so you could design your paper is has uh, some new interview, new informations that could differ from other uh, previous research. Uh, that's um, uh, time consuming, so you have to sit down, <laughs> you have to look and, and compare, and it's I think it's it's the same as uh, so it you try to find uh, links uh, and. What I think is important is that if you find an article and you um, or a research publication, uh, you do it the old school. And what I mean is that you have to go to to look at the references uh, and to 
uh, so like like what is the literature that's used and try to find this literature. Why do I say so? Because if you would use some words just for keywords in the search engine, the search engine will combine this with all the other things that you already looked for while you were doing online shopping. Mm. And, and, that's, and that's partly determining what you will find. So that's, I think that's the problem of the, of, the, uh, of the algorithms of the search engines. So really it's, it's combining, because uh, combining the old school uh, threats like going to the references, uh, ask your colleagues uh, if they have some tips and then you go through a, uh, and then try to find what you can find on, on the internet. Uh, but using the, the names of the, the authors or the, the titles of the of the uh, of the publications that you that you saw and I think that's uh, uh, also connected to questions about digital archives uh, how you can access it there's a lot of digital archives uh, for example in the Netherlands it's some something a question I saw from Vija sending to me uh, so there's, for example, in the digital archive in the Netherlands. Uh, uh, there's a digital archive, it's Delver, and it's it's all newspapers. Uh, they are openly accessed. Uh, there are more and more archives getting open, but you have to find them. And this is also the way how how can you find this? Uh, all these uh, archives is going through this internet and having tips from other friends. Okay. Can I ask? Questions? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, Fleders, thank, you very, Hello. Yeah. Hello. thank you very much for uh, that's a very comprehensive uh, explanation from you. And um, certainly the digital world is like a new world that is like vast and we we might understand a little but most of it that it's, it's really like a wild forest for us <laughs> that is uh, we really hardly understand especially from like a uh, generation which is not native, like as you said. Uh, there's also differences like, I, I would like to ask about the ethical questions. Uh, do you think that we can like apply the, uh, that, that, that ethical question to ourselves when we are doing research? Uh, when the institution that uh, authorize in doing uh, in like setting the boundaries for the ethic on doing research online still hasn't decided on what which standard that we can use on ethical research uh, on online research can we like as a researcher ourselves like we put there that boundaries by ourselves like for example if you just uh, told me about the difference between using the physical interaction research uh, like physical interviews, which is can be different from the uh, data that we can gain from one person's uh, social media. But we probably <coughs> know that in doing research that informed consent is like the, the basic standard ethical for all researchers. Uh, and that kind of using data from online media without consent of the person, we should know that it's not ethical for, for us to use, or is it, uh, or is it ethical for us to use uh, without the consent directly from the persons? That, that one uh, question. And I also believe in what you discussed earlier about, I'm, I'm, uh, my major is uh, law, but reduce. So I, my mind keep, uh, discussing about, keep uh, wondering about the legal questions like digital signature, or digital agreement, when uh, people <coughs> have different identities in, in the online world. Like <laughs> we can have like two uh, emails, two email uh, address for different uses, like one for office, one for uh, personal use, one for social interaction. And sometimes this identities is, uh, represent us actually it's different dimension of us but how how do like there are legal question 
whether these identities are uh, valid and uh, are legitimate in, for example, when we are asked about uh, certain agreement for <clears throat> subscribing or in, uh, or like for subscribing such a, a surface on the internet or things. I think those kind of legal question can follow the development of this online world. And I think we researchers can also like uh, put forward all these questions, whether it's uh, related to the legal question or ethical question. Uh, I just wonder, what do you think about that part, Fridays? Thank you very much. You're welcome to this. Uh, <coughs> the, it's uh, uh, good to see you again. Uh, but uh, the, um, there are two questions. So one, one of the ethical use, and, the, and, and it's about the limits. And, and in fact, what you're pointing at is that there is a discrepancy uh, between the um, what is it between the 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 uh, the regulations and what's already happening in the in the uh, what is it in, in in our research practice? Part of the ethical issues are um, initiated or have input from um, from other kind of sciences. Uh, so we, you always have to kind of uh, think about how to, how you want to deal with this different kind of, uh, <clears throat> with this, the, the background of the, of these ethical questions. Um, for me, um, I think as when, when we have a new area that we have to do research on, uh, and the ethical boards or the institutions are not yet there to have a answer that really fits. I have to go to my own basic ethics. And my basic ethics, no, don't abuse. Be integral. Protect your interviewees. Protect the environment. So there is the, at least the Association of Anthropologists in the Netherlands has a code of ethics. And that's the basic code. That's the bottom line. And that's where at the end, I always try to, to come to, 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 to fit in. Uh, <clears throat> because, uh, some of the, the questions are uh, so. If if it's it's sometimes I, I I meet people on the street and they are they are talking to me. You know, even I see people in the in the in the mall, um, and they tell me about what's happening at some at some location where a uh, Moroccan community. Am I allowed to use this information or not? Do I need their informed consent? It's it's a problem for I can I'm not I'm not animal planet. Uh, you know, Animal Planet has a lot of people behind the camera and asking everybody to sign a letter of consent. So as an anthropologist, you're 24 seven, you're collecting information or you're, you're confronted with information. So there's, there's I cannot, uh, what is it? I cannot level with, with the, the, the complete questions of having all uh, informed consent or, or People agreeing that that I'm going. To, the most important thing is that they know I'm a researcher. That they might know that I will go to use. And I think that's my. <clears throat> there, my position is different from a journalist because people they know there's a journalist and they can write and it's it's more accepted, and not for social scientists because that you are in the in the academia, and you have to be. So you have to really think about it and you have to. Uh, so I, I would I would at that point I would not hesitate and use information. Although there's not yet a, a specific regulation, then about the uh, digital signatures and the different identities people have on the internet, uh, I don't think that's a real uh, issue because I don't need the. I, if I'm so now if there's one person using different identities, <clears throat> and <clears throat> that person is a real person, and that real person should have this. Uh, uh, Consent should should agree with using the information because the <clears throat> different uh, identities are expressions of the same person. Although in in the context of the internet, you know they can they can be used for different. Uh, so it's it's the same as <clears throat> somebody can be a chairman of a soccer group, soccer player, or a, a community, but also teach at university. They're two identities, and the. So if I'm, maybe they probably use the same name, but so there might be something different with the internet. 
uh, but uh, people always have have different identities and different positions. But the one that I have to have this information, this this uh, signature from, is the person who's behind all these different identities. And I think what you show in in your example is <clears throat> how fascinating it is to to use cyberspace uh, to include cyberspace because then people have more identities. Maybe they're different than the identities on uh, offline. That's I hope it's some answer okay. for somebody who's a critical jury, uh, lawyer. <coughs> Terima kasih. Law, yeah. um, Pak Iqbal menanyakan lagi soal, so uh, people can express anything on social media, but part of the information is not actionable, cannot be expressed or realized in real life due to social control or pressure. What kind of meaningful fact we can acquire or learn from this? I think that's what, what I said uh, when I talked about learning languages. Uh, there's a lot of social control uh, on, the, so there's, I think on, on the internet you see <clears throat> in one, one uh, place is more social control. Uh, at the other place, uh, there is uh, more freedom and polarization. At least that's what I see in the Netherlands. I'm, I'm not, mm. not sure about, about Indonesia. And I think that's what we have to learn is how these mechanisms work. Uh, and and that's uh, that's uh, yeah. So I, I th that, that's I think my main question, my main answer. <clears throat> we are used to have conversations, and we are we are all natives in conversation, and we're not not all, not all natives in conversation. On so I, <clears throat> I think that's one one thing that happened when, <clears throat> for example, the tweet Twitter came in. Uh, then there's a limitation of words. So what mm. is the impact of the limitation of words on the way people discuss? Now I don't know about Indonesia, but in the in, in we have Clubhouse. You know Clubhouse? Yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah, have so there's Clubhouse. Well. Sorry. Yeah, we, we. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there's Clubhouse, and Clubhouse has a will uh, have another kind of language. What I mean is, is mm. it because it's it's just temporarily, and some people talk, some people are not. Uh, so it's it's a different kind of setting. So it will, we have to learn to read. Clubhouse. We have to learn to read uh, and to to find the where we see the oppression when we see the uh, the social control in uh, in social media. Okay. Yeah. Saya kira itu poin yang juga memang banyak disentuh oleh antropologi yang dikajian uh, antropologi hmm. digital. Jadi kita memang harus memahami setiap platform internet memiliki karakteristiknya sendiri yang tadi Pak Fridus bilang sebagai language atau bahasa gitu. Dan kemudian kita harus memahami Sebenarnya bagaimana feature-feature itu mempengaruhi perilaku sosial, mempengaruhi ekspresi kita di ruang itu. Uh, terakhir, pertanyaan terakhir mungkin uh, bisa diajukan oleh Bu Ija, mungkin mau menanyakan secara langsung. Halo Pak. Selamat siang. Selamat siang, Ija. <laughs> Apa kabar? Baik, baik, uh, baik. My question is uh, more about academic life. Uh, Uh, I mean, in research, sometimes we need uh, like to discuss with our uh, peer group, and sometimes the peer group is uh, within the research class cluster. Uh, say, say probably from America or from other countries, they came to the uh, Dutch and then they discuss as a research clusters, but. Uh, situation like that is impossible in the COVID. So, uh, what is happening with the peer group? Is it uh, stag stagnant, or uh, the academics is seeking uh, alternative to uh, make uh, research more, you know, meaningful and connect to other countries' uh, social situation? Very good question. <clears throat> uh, I think uh, us being here, and I think there were more than 90 people joining, um, is a is a evidence of uh, how how we are going to work in the future. Um, so let let me share some experience with that. Uh, so I think in the beginning of the COVID, uh, because we were used to travel and then we talk in person and the seminars and so on. And in the beginning, uh, we were paralyzed. 
we stopped. We didn't talk. Well, yeah, no, we didn't talk. We app like Bagumana, Cabernet. That's that was it. <clears throat> and then slowly we started to set up the Zoom meetings, and I think the technology was improving too. Uh, also, the, the the safety of the technology because that's something we didn't discuss, but. If you use Zoom for uh, interview, Zoom is under the jurisdiction of the United States of America. Are uh, we agree with this or don't we agree with it? Uh, you know, it's it's something that you also have to think about. But anyway, so <clears throat> in the beginning there was a stop to this these seminars and this these workshops and, and con conferences. Uh, but then slowly we started to have this peer group discussions online, and I think. Uh, the experience of uh, my colleagues in this large program of uh, the violence, the Dutch violence in between 1945 and 1949, they were always, you know, waiting for this moment to meet and then to talk with each other. And then they started to have these Zoom meetings and there was a more regular discussion. So I think even the, the cooperation, there will be by, it's, it's more dynamic because there was more interaction. Uh, so I, th I, what I hope and what I, I think that we will do in the future is that we still need these physical meetings because that's where you can feel each other, you can, you can have a more connection. But we, but we will go to a hybrid way of uh, having a peer consultation or meetings. Uh, and the hybrid thing will be that sometimes we will meet each other in physical real person and sometimes we do it in zoom uh, or at least on, on on different platforms and maybe we will come to a point where you always will include other people through uh, the through the internet now if if maybe there's a seminar i will be in indonesia we have a seminar we will you will organize something that's also there's people in the in the in the meeting room but there's also the option that people log in and Conway, because the richness of this meeting is that I saw people from OE, there were people from Jogja. I saw two of my friends from, from Amsterdam, Free University, two of my students that I was using their ideas also. Uh, thank you. Uh, but so that's, I think that's uh, making it hybrid also enriches us in the, in the peer communication. So, we were paralyzed by the first part of the COVID, but now we found this, we, 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 what is it? We discovered cyberspace as also a part we can, where we can have our uh, peer review and peer meetings. Uh, and we should continue to do this hybrid as soon as we're allowed to travel again. Uh, Baik, terima kasih. Bringing, but, but bringing ole ole through Zoom meetings <laughs> is different. It's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> ya, yeah, uh, terima kasih Pak Fridus. Uh, saya kira itu penutup yang sangat tepat dalam arti kita tahu bahwa memang COVID mengubah segalanya. Uh, cara kita melakukan riset gitu juga kita dipaksa kemudian untuk menengok uh, internet. Tapi pada saat yang sama kita juga menemukan kemungkinan-kemungkinan yang sebelumnya memang tidak terfikirkan gitu. Apakah dalam kerja-kerja riset sekaligus bahkan dalam kehidupan akademik sendiri gitu termasuk yang tadi Pak Fridus makan salah satunya adalah pertemuan hari ini sebenarnya adalah fenomena yang tidak terfikirkan sebelum COVID gitu dulu memang kita jarang mengundang orang dari Amerika dari Belanda dari mana-mana untuk diskusi sekarang kita bisa punya lebih banyak peserta kita bisa punya uh, interaksi dengan lebih banyak orang uh, melalui ruang meeting yang sebelumnya tidak terfikirkan oleh Zoom Uh, saya berterima kasih sekali lagi mewakili PMB LIPI, Pak Fridus sudah bersedia untuk uh, sharing uh, dengan kami di sini. Semoga nanti kita punya waktu yang uh, lebih baik, di waktu yang lebih baik untuk bersilaturahmi secara fisik, juga mungkin online lagi ke depan. Uh, semoga kita semua sehat. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, selamat sore dan selamat siang di Belanda sana. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih Mas Ibnu. Terima Thank kasih, you, Pak Fridus. Terima kasih, Ibnu. Thank you, everyone. Terima kasih, Pak Fridus. Hey, Lita. Terima kasih, Pak Fridus.
Pak Pridus mungkin mengajari kami lebih mendasar lagi tentang riset ke depannya. Yang kuel, Pridus. But since 